Hello and welcome to Be Kind Connects. I'm your host, Shabnam Islam. And joining us today in the studio are Light and Angel from Gentle World. Gentle World is an educational organization whose core purpose is to build a more peaceful society through veganism, outreach, advocacy, and education for more than 40 years. Thank you so much, Light and Angel, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, Shabnam. We're happy to be here. I, so, I don't know of any other way to make a more peaceful world than being vegan. And I would love to hear your story and how that even came about. Um, tell us briefly a little bit about you and Son and, and how you guys came about going vegan when the term vegan wasn't even really a thing yet. Wasn't a thing at all. We had never heard the word or the concept. Uh, when uh, Son who uh, was my wife, and at the time we were actually rising in love. I don't like to say falling because that's not actually what happens. You have to rise to be in love. Well, we would spend all night talking about what our futures would be, and we decided the best thing to do with our futures was to seek out the truth, and when we found it, to live it. We couldn't think of a better idea. And shortly after that, conversation we went to a movie and we saw depicted on the screen four or five husky men with sledgehammers and fishing boots up to their chests hitting a huge bull over their head as hard as they could it was horrendous and the poor creature as big as he was it took i don't know 10 blows to send him to his knees and eventually to kill him and he was screaming, and it was just horrible. We came out of that theater, we said, wow, is that how they get meat? So, well, that's the truth. We can't ignore that. And from that point on, we stopped eating meat, and we remained vegetarian, I would say, a year or a little more than a year. And uh, we decided, we lived in near Syracuse, and there was a, a uh, dairy popular dairy. We thought we'd go visit and see what was going on there. We were very ignorant. We thought we could eat dairy, that all they did was take the milk from the cow, no big deal. And we went there, and when we got there, there was a cow screaming and bellowing. It was, I didn't know if she was giving birth or if somebody was branding. It was just terrible. She was crying and screaming. And the woman owner said, oh, well, don't let that bother you. She'll only keep that up for two or three weeks. It's because we have to take their babies away, their calves, so they won't take out the milk from the mother, you know, because that's what we sell. Well, we said, well, we don't, we don't want to get used to that. We want to do something about it. And we left, of course. And uh, that was the beginning of we stopped eating dairy. We, we, thought, we, were, we thought we had invented it because we never heard we had heard of people who were vegetarian. We never heard of anybody not eating dairy or wearing leather or, or, or what, what veganism is. So that was the beginning for us. And that was then, uh, actually that was in 1970, which is the, uh, the Middle Ages now. <laughs> not so much. But that wasn't yet the advent of the gentle world, correct? It took you guys another decade to actually fully form this organization? Well, it started, initially, it started as an intentional community. And that was a little bit earlier than the formation of the, um, the nonprofit. So it was founded as a 501c3 in 1981. And that's a decade after Light and Sun became vegan. But in the years in between, they started to join together with other friends who also understood what they were saying about veganism. Because when they would talk to people about it, Everybody thought they were crazy. Everybody thought they had lost their minds and that they were going to die because they weren't getting protein and then they weren't getting calcium. And so when they spoke to certain friends about it who said, actually, I, I understand what you're saying and that makes sense and I would like to do that too. Uh, at that time, those people wanted to live together because it was just felt like us, them against the world, you know, nobody else understood. So they joined together as a cooperative, as a collective and started to live together and over those years they were talking to people about veganism and basically 
really strongly moved by this essentially a mission to spread the word. And so it kind of grew naturally into doing educational things and they started making recipes and then they put together a cookbook. And it was when they actually published the cookbook in 1981 that it became, you know, they incorporated as a 501c3 and that's how Gentle World, the educational organization was born. It was finally the first vegan cookbook all vegan cookbook in America at the time. The first full length, there were yep. collections of vegan recipes that had been put out by like the American Vegan Society and some other, you know, like educational pamphlets and things like that. But an actual full length recipe book that was all 100% vegan. It was the very first in 1981. Actually, uh, our publisher wouldn't let us use the word vegan because nobody knew what it meant. We had to call it total vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. considered a real classic of the vegan movement. You know, people who go back long enough remember it as um, like a saving grace at that time when people didn't really know what to eat and what to cook and they were eating a lot of rice and beans and, you know, a lot of the same stuff. So the cookbook for people who love animals really was like a, a, a light in the darkness at that time. And it's since sold over 100,000 copies. It's still in publication. It was never... Um, never put onto a computer so even when people buy it today it's the same typewritten you know the font of the typewriter because it actually was done on a typewriter and yeah, we may have that to explain the term typewriter <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what they have no idea they have no idea they they find that even like a phone attached by a cord is uh <laughs> is a little um, out of date <laughs> yeah <laughs> Why don't you call it an educational center and a community? Because that is truly what Gentle World is. Um, and so could you could you tell people what what can they find? What resources can they find through the Gentle World, World organization? Well, we have an extensive website that is um, a collection of articles we've written over the years. We do have an about us section, which tells a bit about um, our history and what we've done and um, for a while, we were doing a, a, a visitor education program where people could come and actually visit and, and, and spend time with us and, and learn about veganism, learn how to cook, learn how to eat, learn how to grow food. At the moment, that's on hold because of COVID, and we hope to be able to um, pick it up again in the future. Um, but in the meantime, we try to do a lot of online education through the articles on our website. And also, um, we have a YouTube channel, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page. And we have a newsletter that people can subscribe to. So that gives people the opportunity to just tune in and, you know, connect with what we're doing and what we're about. Um, and the main thing is, you know, on our website, we also have, of course, we have our cookbooks. There's two two vegan cookbooks that have been released over the years. We also published a couple of the earliest vegan nutrition books by um, Dr. Michael Clapper um, back in the 70s, 80s. 80s, 1980s, vegan nutrition, pure and simple, and pregnancy children and the vegan diet. They were two of the very first vegan nutrition books ever. And then we've recently also published an ebook. So it's a free downloadable um, ebook called Demystifying Veganism with 20 Simple Questions. It's a collection of vegan frequently asked questions, just the things that we've heard over and over again and our um, the best answers we've been able to come up with to help people understand what veganism is all about. And you did say that the facility is now closed due to COVID restrictions. Uh, is it? Do you have one in New Zealand and one in Hawaii still? Are there two different locations? There are both locations, and they're both currently being um, you know staffed and watched after by Gentle World volunteers. So they're being maintained, and um, we continue with things like our veganic growing operation. Gentle World has been also at the forefront of vegan organic gardening and growing, which is um, you know a distinction from organic growing in that we don't use any animal ingredients in the garden either. We call it veganic, by the way. Veganic growing. So both of our centers are demonstration centers for veganic growing. Um, but at this point, we're not able to welcome people to actually come and stay. But if people are in the area, if they're here on the big island of Hawaii or in the north of New Zealand, they're welcome to come by for, you know, a day visit that meet us. And here in Hawaii, we would call it talk story, you know, sit and chat about veganism. And, and again, you know, learn about it from our perspective because it is, we do have a kind of a unique perspective on veganism given the history 
And one thing that we always try to pass on to people is just that this is not a diet. You know, this is not about, um, I mean, the, you know, the health benefits, of course, are a wonderful side effect. But to us, veganism has always been about the ethical um, aspect of just we don't want to harm animals through our lives. We don't need to. Mm. We uh, prefer not to be inflicting pain and suffering and torture on innocent beings. Um, and we believe that it's wrong to do that. So we try to always pass that on to people, the, the significance of that. Right. The term ahimsa, which means do no harm. That's that's our mantra. Nonviolence. Do no harm, nonviolence. And so, uh, Angel, I would actually like to ask you, so what is currently your role with The Gentle World? So I'm the outreach director. And I've been involved with Gentle World since the year 2000, so it's almost 23 years ago now. And I really became vegan when I met Light and Sun. And I had kind of, I had learned a lot about veganism from other people I knew who were activists. But it was when I met Light and Sun and heard their story and heard about their tremendous commitment becoming vegan in 1970, um, that I really understood, you know, what, what this really is i had started to you know change my diet and i understood a bit about dairy and eggs and things like that but um but when i learned about the two of them becoming vegan back when they didn't even know what to eat you know and son said to me there were no health food stores there was no tofu there was no soy milk you know we didn't know how to get shoes or bread or anything um and when i started to put that together in my mind and realizing that this is a this is much bigger than than i thought it was um, that's when I became vegan and uh, became a part of the organization. And so over the last 23 years, I've been volunteering with Gentle World and I took on the role of outreach director to try to help our message get out there further through the internet and online outreach and all of that kind of thing. Well, she can work a computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. because well the typewriters don't cut it anymore. <laughs> There are other people in Gentle World who can work the computer, but he's not one of them. <laughs> That's adorable. I love this. Uh, so, Light, I, I have to ask, you know, uh, having such a a loving life with your partner, son, um, and being, being able to create, uh, you know, an empire in, the, in what you believe is in the reflection of your love. And that's what I see as the gentle world. How, how has this changed since the passing of Sun? Or has it changed at all? It's changed greatly. She was my navigator. You know, it's like I felt I was like the pilot and she was the navigator. And uh, it's almost like I still can't accept it. And uh, how has it changed? Well, without her input, it, it's changed greatly. It has to, uh, we, we make our decisions now without her and it's certainly not as uh, easy as it was. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, I, I do want people to know, we, we, we of course don't, you know, she, she passed away from cancer like so many. And we, we took every test we could because we couldn't understand how she could have cancer after being 40 odd year vegan and the only the only thing we came up with that was out of line and where the numbers were very high i'd like to add was glyphosate which we of course don't use that's roundup and all those you know killing products and uh, her her marker was way up and then we can only assume that that was the cause because it's ubiquitous and we don't use it but it's it's all around us, so we, there's no getting away from it. I just want to put that out there so people don't think, oh, she was a vegan all these years, how'd she get cancer? Which, of course, we ask the same question. Of course, it, it, it does, uh, it, it's, it's healthy on every level, and it, it's, it, it changes one's, people don't realize this, it changes one's cells, especially everywhere in the body, <clears throat> with what you put inside your body. When mainly in, in one's brain, you begin to think differently. You begin to expand your your compassion and your feelings for other people and for other things, for that matter, not just people. You're more careful about what you do with your trash. You, 
you're more aware of how people feel and it just changes your basic personality for the better. I wish they would try it in uh, in situations, for example, like prisons. Make prisons vegan. See what that does to the inmates, how it changes them. Because I guarantee it will for the better. It's just a gentler way to live. I agree. If it's about re- if it's about rehabilitation, you should do that with food, and you need to heal with plants. And I think you're absolutely right. It changes our biochemistry. It changes it changes our brain chemistry, and um, it has a lot of power to heal. I just wanted to say about sun quickly that um, when people used to come here and visit us, the people who were not vegan, uh, she always made a point of sitting down with every single person to tell them her and Light's story and and speak about veganism from from her own perspective, which was unique, and. Um, after she had passed, we were tremendously grateful that we had her telling her story on video. And, uh, you know, she had a very, very passionate way of describing the realizations that she had had. And um, so if people want to learn more about her and learn more about Light and Sun's story, uh, we do have videos on our YouTube channel where you can hear it from her own, from her own lips um, because it's really it's really worthwhile. I know for me, Sun, Sun was the, you know, the um, instigator for my own veganism because I was kind of teetering on the brink and um, still had a lot of resistance. And, and um, we were doing a, um, a seminar here, which I was participating in, you know, doing different logistical things, but Sun spoke at the seminar and it was her the 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 talk that she gave that really tipped me over the edge and i know it has been for a lot of people throughout her 50 years of veganism um she connected with a lot of people in such a way that made them recognize something inside themselves that that awakened to to the message of veganism so i do encourage everybody to visit our youtube channel and see um see her speaking and also read some of her writing on our website because she just was also an exceptional writer she wrote, she wrote a poem actually called Let Conscience Be Your God, which is a, a valuable thing for people to understand. If, if That's the God part of us, our conscience. It tells us what's right from wrong. And cruelty is wrong. There is, it's irrefutable. There's no good for cruelty. And eating animals, not just eating them, using them, killing elephants for their tusks and just everything and, and experimenting on beagle, just everything that people do, they're not going to find peace until they stop. They're not going to find peace until they stop war and killing on animals that have no, they have no defense. It's a very sad situation. I think I've never had an interview where I've had people speak so much from the heart that it makes me so emotional. And I... I think that that's that's really what you do with the gentle world is you 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 have so powerfully stated what people need to do with such kindness and that is that is truly that is truly takes quite a character to do that so my question excuse me go ahead (laughs) oh no please this is i would love for you to finish what you're saying i was just going to say we didn't start out with so much kindness we, well, because we, was, we couldn't, we thought, I thought at the time that America would become vegan in 10 years. It was so obviously true what we found out, that it's cruel. But that didn't happen. I lost a lot of friends. And my parents thought I would die. My mother was a chef. She used to sneak animal, like animal gravy, into the food she made, you know, thinking we would die from lack of protein. We eventually had to stop eating with people. That's how the commune formed. We could eventually we couldn't we couldn't sit at the same table with people eating the legs of animals and the you know and the parts of animals we just couldn't do that and that's how the commune formed we found other people who agreed with us and pretty soon we uh, formed our own world which is still going on today the back then communes were communes it was easy for people to join communes. But the, you know, the people in power, they made that a dirty word, like communists or whatever. The truth is the whole world is a commune. 
If they only learn that, we're all part of the commune, the commune of human beings. But uh, they haven't gotten to that yet. They haven't even gotten close, I'm afraid. The world is in a sad state of affairs. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> Has yeah. anybody not noticed that? It's in a sad state of affairs. And and even what you just said, that uh, people don't speak from the heart in the same way. I feel like there's this disconnection that is that is plaguing everybody. And, you know, we need to get back to that. It's so important that we connect with our feelings because they do tell us what's real. And certainly when it comes to not that your feelings are always real, they're not always going to tell you the truth, but when you watch one of these vegan videos, I mean, if people haven't had the chance to watch an expose video of a, a slaughterhouse or one of these terrible, terrible facilities where animals are being kept, the feelings that that brings up in us are the clue to the reality of the situation. If we just always close our eyes to it and close our hearts to it, then we can keep this going somehow people are able to you know put it out of sight put it out of mind put it out of heart but when we open our eyes and when we open our hearts to the reality of it it just it's so obvious it's so incredibly obvious that this is something that does not gel with our authentic selves um people are afraid to face those feelings because they're afraid i think not only of what they you know they perceive that they have to give up or whatever but they're afraid of their own guilt. They're afraid of their, the feelings of shame that we have around that. But that's a mistake because those feelings of guilt and shame don't go away. We just, you know, suppress them if we keep doing what, you know, continuing to behave in the same way. But if we actually allow that to come up in ourselves and recognize it and say, okay, I'm feeling this way, that tells me something about what I need to do, something I need to change in order to feel comfortable in myself, then we can make that change and move forward and actually release those feelings and let them go and say, okay, that's in my past now. I'm not, I'm not that person anymore. I don't have to, you know, dwell on these feelings. Um, so it's really a liberation is what it is. I mean, people think of it as a like a deprivation, but the truth is they don't know what they're missing out on. The feeling of being vegan is so much better, so much more fulfilling than anything that you have to give up. Um, I wish people could know. I wish people could just know how good they would feel just from doing it, you know, get a little glimpse into the future. And not just the feelings. We actually became, since I grew up in the hotel business, resort hotel business, where food was of essential importance. And when I began, when we began as uh, vegans, and we finally learned what it was, the food was bland. And I knew that uh, I couldn't get people to change into that food. So we became known as the food people. At the time, we had the best vegan chefs. Now they're all over the place. But back then, we were pretty much the only ones that had vegan chefs that could make delicious meals. We held two vegan banquets with celebrity banquets where the first one was in Calabasas, California. We had the Celebrities that the kids might not know today. Well, Sidney Poitier, Drew Barrymore. Danny Glover. Danny Glover. Some of them are still around. We had about 35 big name celebrities. We were hoping, and we, we didn't charge them anything. We paid for everything, including valet parking. We had 21 main dishes from 21 countries in different beautiful tents. It, it cost us back then, I'd say, close to $20,000, which today would probably be, I don't know, $100,000. And after that was over, we had so much food that we filled Steven Spielberg's freezer and many other notables who were, again, I don't know if the young people would even know who they were, but I guess Spielberg they would. And that's what we did. We filled their freezers. They would just, they didn't say how much money is. They would just say, fill my freezer, whatever it was. I'm sure it's been covered. It was back before influencer culture. They were trying to influence those who are an inspiration to others. It was kind of like the beginning of that idea that maybe if we reach somebody with a big platform, they'll be able to um, promote this message way more widely than, than Gentle World could do on its own. So how can people get more involved with the Gentle World? Even if they're not in Hawaii or if they're not in New Zealand, how can they be involved with your organization? 
Well, um, one thing we really are actually looking for right now is um, content creators. So I would love to hear from some people who want to write, you know, I mean, people who have um, a desire to spread the vegan message and writing is their art form. Um, I'd love to have some more people uh, contributing essays and even, you know, writing reviews and all sorts of different things. So if anybody feels so moved to do that, um, please do get in touch. Or if anybody has, you know, just other kind of content creation skills that they would like to share, um, I encourage them to reach out to me. Um, our website, gentleworld.org, is the place for, um, you know, finding out all about us and getting in contact. And um, as I said, we also do have a Facebook page and an Instagram page and a YouTube, but gentleworld.org is really our main hub. So if people want to reach out, that is the way. So like, I think I want to end with this question, which I would really like to hear from you. What would you like your lasting legacy to be? The closing of the last slaughterhouse in the world and the stopping of abusing animals in every form that they do is treating animals like the wonderful creatures they are. Like we, like not we, but not everybody, but like most people treat their dogs and cats. You could treat a cow the same way or a horse or an elephant. I just heard the count of elephants used to be, I don't know, 3 million, and they're down to 400,000. And that's almost every kid that was my favorite animal I know back, you know, other than the dogs. The wild animals were elephants. I'm sure of kids today still, because they're so big and gentle. It's just, that, that's, that would be my legacy. They would stop hurting animals and, of course, stop hurting each other. Not hurting, not hurting is general. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm only for not hurting animals, but I don't care about hurting people. That's ridiculous. To hurt an animal is uh, no different than hurting people. It comes from the same misplaced thinking. And we're not going to stop having wars unless we stop making war with all the lesser, lesser, not lesser in, in feeling, but lesser in, 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 in certain capabilities, of course. If we stop hurting animals, we're not going to stop hurting ourselves. Wow. Thank you so much. I thank you both so much for sharing your time and for creating the gentle world, light and sun, and uh, continuing to share your gifts with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, you. the opportunity. I love being able to do this. And this is what we need more of. Absolutely. And thank you to our VKind community because that wraps up this episode of VKind Connects with light and angel from a gentle world. To learn more about A Gentle World, please check out the website on our screen. And thank you for watching this episode, and we hope to see you next time.